Hebrews chapter 12 is where we are going to kind of jump back into our study of the doctrine of providence as we think tonight, particularly about how God's providence works in the temptation even of his people. And looking at the question of whether God is sovereign even when we fall into sin. And the scriptures would certainly affirm that he is indeed always sovereign. Let's ask God's blessing on his word and then we'll read tonight. Father, as we open scripture, we are mindful that we are unable on our own power and on our own wisdom and strength to be able to understand it rightly for salvation. We need you to guide us. We need your spirit to help us. And we pray for that blessing, even this night, that he might open the eyes of our hearts to see the wondrous things revealed in your word that we would see you, that we would see Christ, that we would be strengthened by the Spirit through the preaching, through the hearing, through the accepting and believing of your word, and that it would comfort and encourage us and help us even this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 5, the writer says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we might share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This is the word of God. I want to return to the confession for just a moment and reread with you from chapter 5, points 5 through 7, which is the material that we will primarily be addressing tonight. The Westminster Confession, again, it's on the handout, or you can find it in the back of the hymnal. Chapter 5, points 5 through 7 this evening. The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruptions of their own hearts, to chastise them for their former sins, or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, that they may be humbled, and to raise them to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself, and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin, and for sundry other just and holy ends. As for those wicked and ungodly men whom God as a righteous judge for former sins doth blind and harden, from them he not only withholdeth his grace, whereby they might have been enlightened in their understandings and wrought upon in their hearts, but sometimes also withdraweth the gifts which they had, and exposeth them to such objects as their corruption makes occasions of sin, and withal gives them over to their own lusts, the temptations of the world, and the power of Satan, whereby it comes to pass that they harden themselves, even under those means which God useth for the softening of others. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner it taketh care of his church, and disposeth all things to the good thereof. Last week we began looking at this section of the confession as a way of organizing and summarizing the doctrine of providence that's taught in Scripture. I think many Christians, even who love to talk about the doctrine of providence, have not thought carefully or thoroughly about how far His providence extends. If we understand from Scripture that God has ordained whatsoever shall come to pass, then that has In some way, that has to include even our sin. And not just the sin that we were guilty of in the past, but He knew before time and ordained that there would be even the sin that as saints we continue to struggle with. And that may be a difficult doctrine to understand initially. We may wrestle with the idea that how how could God possibly ordain that His people would fall into sin? 
And so over the last couple of weeks, particularly, we've tried to very carefully parse that out, recognizing that in Scripture, this doctrine is taught in a way that protects the purity and the blamelessness of God's character in this regard. That God is ordaining all things, but God is not the primary or effectual agent of everything that happens. He is the first cause, but He is not the only cause. And what we see in the passages uh, from the confession that we just read is this summary that acknowledges that essentially God gets out of the way and allows evil men to do the evil that they intend. And yet he doesn't always do that. Not even Hitler kicked every dog that he walked past. And surely every one of us can see in our lives, both before conversion and since conversion, many times when God prevented us from doing the sin that we were willing to do, the evil that we desired to do, and yet through whatever circumstance, God held us back and kept us from it. But He does not always do so. Sometimes, as we saw last week in the life of Hezekiah, sometimes God allows a righteous man to face a temptation or a trial of some sort in order to humble him. God will turn his face away, as it were, for a time, not altogether abandoning his servant, but allowing his servant to stand on his own so that he might learn that he cannot stand upon his own. This is like a child who with this rebellious or selfish uh, intention of I'm going to do it myself, don't help me at all. Sometimes the best solution to that is for the parent to let them do it themselves and fall on their face. And so be convinced that they are not as strong or as capable as that they as they like to imagine themselves to be. Tonight we are going to pick up by looking at the reasons for God's discipline in the lives of His saints. And the confession identifies at least five categories of reason, as it were, for God to allow the saints to struggle. To struggle with temptation, to experience various trials. He has ordained this for our good. He disciplines those whom He loves, as the text of Scripture has said. And so why is that? Well, first, to chastise the saints for sin. Sometimes the way in which God disciplines us for sin is by allowing us to sin in just the way that we want. Augustine said in the Confessions, Book 1, So by those who did not do well, thou didst well for me, and by my own sin thou didst justly punish me, for thou hast commanded, and so it is, that every inordinate affection should be its own punishment. If you've never read the Confessions, I do recommend it. It is really the first kind of spiritual autobiography, and it's essentially a book of prayer. It's a book in which Augustine is talking to the Lord about his own experience, wrestling against the Lord and coming ultimately to faith in Jesus Christ. And so in this passage, he is praying to God. He is speaking to God about the way in which God providentially worked in his life, even in times of sin. That he would allow Augustine to fall into sin in order to show Augustine that sin is not satisfying. We've said many times before that Jesus takes all of the fun out of sin. There was a time in your life and in mine perhaps where sin was enjoyable. The passing pleasures of sin that the book of Hebrews talks about in Hebrews chapter 11 was a very real experience in our lives. We sinned because it was fun to sin. We wanted to sin. It was giving in to the desires of the flesh and there was some gratification in that. And yet as a regenerate believer, as a born again person, Jesus takes away the joy, as it were, or the enjoyment that we once found in indulging the flesh. Because now the experience of sin is profoundly unsatisfying. There is guilt, there is shame, there is frustration, there is self-loathing, there is pain, there is contrition. If there's not, you need to be worried. I'm not kidding. That is, those are the moments where uh, a saint really needs to begin to take note of a heart that is becoming hardened against the Lord. It could even call into question that person's salvation as to whether, whether they really are regenerate or not. But for most of us, we find that when we indulge in sin, any gratification that we hope to receive by that is either not there at all or is quickly passing away as we are now overwhelmed by the conviction that follows. God does that sometimes in our lives. 
We see that in Hezekiah. We see that in David. We see that even in Judas, although Judas not as a regenerate person, but as an unregenerate person. The Lord allows him to go his own way, even to the point of his own destruction. And thank God that he does not do that in the lives of his children. There have been times with my children when I have allowed them to stubbornly or selfishly persist in something they wanted to do, knowing that the doing of that thing would be its own form of punishment and that it would be an instructive experience. But I don't allow them to do that in terms of handling loaded firearms that they don't know how to handle. I don't do that in terms of letting the boys play soccer in traffic, right, on the road, because I recognize that that sort of indulgence, that sort of selfishness could lead to their destruction. And so as a loving father, I prevent them from doing some of the foolish things that they otherwise might do. And thank God that he does that in our own hearts and in our own lives as well. We need to beware of testing God and testing God in the sense of throwing before him those things that we want, seeking to test his faithfulness, seeking to prove him to ourselves. We need to say, thy will be done rather than becoming those to whom God will say, have your own way, have your own way, because that will never be for our benefit. A second thing that the confession identifies in terms of God's discipline by means of this providential suffering in the lives of the saints is to reveal the strength of corruption and deceit lingering in the heart so that we may be humble. Let's go in our Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 for a minute. We're going to look at just a few passages. I am, I am resting heavily on the weight of Scripture that we have looked at over the last three weeks in this series. So we may not look at quite as many tonight. But we will look at a few. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, or reading just verse 4 at this point, the Apostle Paul says this, For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Now, Paul is honest. He's a man who practices self-examination. He is a man who takes seriously the possibility of his disqualification. As he says later in chapter 9, I discipline my body. I buffet my body. He uses a Greek word that literally means to strike under the eye. Paul's basically saying, I punch myself in the face. <laughs> Lest after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. He trains hard as, as, a, as a servant of the Lord God. And yet he says, my ignorance of any blemish in my heart or in my life does not acquit me before God. It does not justify me before God because Paul understands quite well the truth that is affirmed in both Old and New Testaments that the saints have secret sins that we nevertheless struggle with. And those secret sins are not talking about hypocrisy. Those are not talking about the sins that you've fallen into that you've kept secret from your family or from your brethren or that you would be ashamed if anyone were to know. No, we're talking about the secret sins mentioned in Psalm 19. Where, the, where David, speaking by inspiration, says uh, 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 to forgive me for my secret sins, but also not allow presumptuous sin to reign over me. And what he's describing there are says, two different types of error that comes up in our lives. A presumptuous error where we pursue sin knowingly and a secret error that is unknown to us. And it's not a coincidence that that prayer comes at the end of a reflection upon the value of Scripture. Because what does Scripture do? It exposes faults that we didn't even realize that we had. If we're reading it carefully, if we're reading it well, if we're reading it prayerfully, then as we're reading Scripture on a fairly regular basis, we are going to be confronted by and convicted about those attitudes, maybe those actions, maybe beliefs, that we did not even perceive were at variance with the revealed will of God before. But now we see it. I've had that experience actually teaching classes publicly. You would think by the time you have studied a passage enough to get up and teach it in a public forum, surely you're not going to come under conviction reading it. But I've had that very experience before. Not often, but multiple times. Where even as we are teaching a passage of Scripture, something becomes apparent to me that was not apparent in hours and hours of study prior to that session. And that's, that's going to happen. Now sometimes, God will use our sin in that way. He will show us our sin by allowing us to fall into that sin. He will show us our pride by allowing us to exercise it. Go back to Philippians chapter 3 now. 
where we have read before in in an earlier portion of the study, Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, Paul here has been describing the, the pride that the Judaizers presumably put in the matters of the flesh and the contrast with this forsaking of all fleshly advantages in the pursuit of Christ. And yet, even having forsaken all things, Paul says this, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Sin is deceptive. And we must not trust our hearts. You cannot give yourself a pass saying, well, God knows my heart. God knows that I love him. God knows that I'm sincere. God may know all of those things, but I assure you, God knows more things about our hearts that we ought to be ashamed of that we don't even realize ourselves yet. (laughs) Those things that are hidden in the recesses of our hearts that he has not yet drug out into the light yet. He knows our hearts And that's a major part of the problem in our lives. And yet he is working redemptively to unmask our hearts, to expose those things to the light. And surely every one of us have had experiences where we have fallen into temptation and sin and had to confront deficiencies in our own sanctification that we did not even perceive prior to that occasion. God can show us pride in that way. God can show us selfishness. God can show us lust. He can show us anger. He can can show us many things that we did not see before. Why doesn't the Lord purify us completely right now? I think in part to keep us humble. To keep us depending upon His grace. Because if there was in fact some type of second blessing, if there was in fact a sinless perfection that was attainable in this life, we would begin to take the grace of God for granted. And that itself would be Sin. In other words, it's impossible, right? A third reason that the confession identifies at least for this is to raise the saints to a more close and constant dependence on God for their support. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You're familiar, of course, with Paul's thorn in the flesh. Uh, Bible students debate what, in fact, this thorn may have been. There have been many uh, imaginative suggestions and possibilities offered by students of Scripture. I think that there are pretty strong implications in the book of Acts and Galatians that Paul is losing his eyesight as his ministry progresses. And so I've always kind of assumed that that would be what this thorn might be, is that he's functionally blind at this point. But regardless of what the particular sort of suffering might be, it was obviously something that troubled Paul greatly. And yet look at the way that he frames this experience, beginning in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Do you suppose that the intention of the devil in this case was to humble Paul? Do you think that that's what Satan is doing? Is he saying, if I I torment Paul in this way, then it'll keep Paul humble and make him a more fit servant of the Lord. That's not Satan's desire. Satan's desire is to jam that thorn in Paul's flesh to discourage him to the point of despair. To make it so difficult for Paul to do his work that he despairs of even being a vessel for use in the master's kingdom. And yet the Lord ordains that and permits Satan to do that for an altogether different purpose. That is the humility of his his servant Paul and also drawing him closer to himself. Notice verse 8. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do you think that Paul understood that? in this way, at this level, prior to experiencing this thorn? I don't think so. I think Paul probably had an intellectual understanding of this doctrine of providence and the way in which it's related to the doctrine of sanctification. 
I think Paul probably could have preached a pretty good sermon about that subject, but it's altogether different when he experiences the torment of the devil in his own flesh. He pleads three times with God to take it away. Now, I suspect that pleading in this case is something more than mentioning it as an aside when Paul is giving thanks for his Big Mac at lunch, you know? God, thank you for this food. Please bless it to my body's nourishment and please take away my thorn. Amen. Right? I don't think it's that kind of pleading. I think this is Paul pouring himself out before the throne of grace. He is being prompted to pray in a way that he would not have otherwise prayed unless the Lord had allowed the devil to bring this trouble into his life. And then what is the outcome of that? God says no and yet that answer brings Paul closer to Christ to rest more fully on his power, to rejoice even in his sufferings. And again, this is not a question of Paul learning something that is altogether unknown prior to this experience, but it is coming to know something by experience at a level that was never understood before. You see, there is a difference between knowing something intellectually and experiencing the reality of that in our own flesh, in our own life, in our own family. Uh, the Sunday before I got married on Saturday, the Sunday before I got, because I was already in full-time ministry, the Sunday before I got married on Saturday, I preached a lesson on marriage. I did that to demonstrate that I already understood what the Bible taught about marriage. How stupid was that? So conceited. And you know something? I think, I've still got the notes, I could go back and check. I think probably everything I said in that sermon was exactly right. right? I mean, I was just following Scripture. I'm just unpacking passages of Scripture. But you know what I found out in the first year or two or 17 of, or oh, 16, however many years we've been married, 17-ish? Yeah, 17, okay, all right. I found out that I don't know nearly as much about marriage as I thought that I did that Sunday. You see, there was an intellectual understanding of certain truths. Now there is an experiential understanding of those truths. We understand that with regard to children, right? I had older Christians tell me when Kirstie was pregnant with Hannah, having a child is going to change your life. And I very humbly said, I know. I didn't have any idea. I had, no, I had seen my parents have children, and, and I thought, I know what it's like to have a child. I've been changing diapers for years. Kirstie and I had been babysitting children. My firstborn wasn't the first child that I had to discipline by spanking. I understood what it was to have a child. Nope. I did not understand what it was like to have a child. And see, that's the way it is in terms of our sanctification. Some things that you learn by studying Scripture under the teaching ministry of the church have to be Pressed home by the experience of suffering, by the experience of testing, by the experience even of temptation, even falling into sin. Because weakness forces us to rely on God's grace for strength in a way that nothing else can. And not even Paul can get away without experiencing this. God has to humble us in these ways in order to draw us closer to himself. Fourth. God does this to make the saints more watchful against future temptations. Surely you have seen this in your own life. That when God allows us to fall into sin, it brings conviction with it, it brings shame, it brings repentance. And what's on the other side of repentance? There is a renewed desire never to go down that road again. Even knowing that we probably will. Even knowing that we will probably repeat many of those same mistakes that we've made. And yet there is a desire never again to transgress. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 just as an example of this. When Paul is talking to the Corinthians about biblical repentance, godly sorrow that leads to true repentance. What is the outcome of that? What is the fruit of that repentance? Pick up the reading with me in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 7. Paul says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. Is there such a thing as godly grief? Yes, indeed. What lies on the other side of that? 
repentance. Would God allow us to fall into circumstances that prompt godly grief to bring about greater repentance? Absolutely, He does. He did in the Corinthians experience. Verse 10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Let me say something. I have, I have seen Christians and known Christians at times who I think still long for the good old days. Back before they had to clean up their act and start becoming a church-going person, there were some good times. And there is, not, there is not this real fruit of unregretted repentance that is at least evident in their lives. Maybe it's in their hearts. But talking to some, I wonder, is it a repentance without regret? Or is it a repentance that essentially looks at the return on investment and says, if I, if I give this up, I won't go to hell, and that's worth giving this up. But I would love to be able to not go to hell and keep that in my life, right? Paul says real repentance is repentance without regret. Well, guess what? Sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Sometimes we need to fall into sin. Sometimes we fall into temptation to remind us there's a reason that we repented in the, in the first place. And there's a reason that we continue to repent every single day. Look at verse 11. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in this matter. They weren't innocent, but they have repented in such a way that they desire to be innocent, and that is on display for everyone. When I counsel people after an experience of infidelity or after a husband perhaps has fallen into pornography and we talk about transparency and accountability on the other side of repentance, anytime I see any reluctance to be transparent and accountable, I question whether there has been repentance at all. And it's because of this passage. You know what real repentance looks like? Repentance is the inward turning. Repentance is the change of heart. But real repentance leads to fruit. And what is the fruit? This desire to show to the entire world, I never want to have any part with this again. You want to check my email? You want to check my internet usage? You want to be up in my life and in my business? And absolutely, I want you there. I want you to see everything that I, my life is an open book. I want you there because I want to prove myself clear and innocent in this matter. See, that's a penitent heart. And that's part of the reason I think God allows us to fall into sin, to fall into temptation, to be overtaken, but not ultimately overcome. And it's so that in the future, we will be more watchful. We'll recognize, I remember what happened the last time I went down this road. I know how this story ends. I don't want to go there again. That is real repentance. And then, of course, the confession says that the Lord will do this for many other righteous and holy ends. Go back to Romans chapter 8 for just a minute. And let me remind you of something that I think you already know very, very well, but it bears repeating regularly. Romans chapter 8, this great promise that we set so much hope and trust in, in verse 28, is tied by context to the doctrine of sanctification, believe it or not. Look at verse 28 of Romans chapter 8. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foredue, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. You say, I don't say, I don't see sanctification anywhere in there. That word doesn't appear. It says that he's called, justified, glorified. It doesn't say that he's called, justified, sanctified, glorified. But did you notice verse 29 defines the good that God promises to work all things according to? See, he doesn't say all things will work according to the good of your bank account. All things will work according to the good of your marriage. All things will work according to the good of your relationship with your children. All things will work according to the good for your other relationships that you may have in your life. He says all things are going to work together according to the good that God has appointed for you. And the good that he has appointed for you is to be like Jesus Christ. And then verse 30 is describing the outworking of that eternal purpose. How is he going to make us like Jesus Christ? By calling us, by justifying, and ultimately by glorifying. 
That's how he's going to bring it about. And sanctification is a part of that. But what we see is that the good that he has ordained for his people is to say, I'm going to make you more like Jesus. And you know, one of the ways that he made Paul more like Jesus is by allowing the devil to drive a thorn into his body and refusing to take it out. The Father mercifully, graciously says it will be better for you to hurt. It will be better for you to struggle. It will be better for you to suffer in the eternal purpose that I have for you than for me to relieve that suffering at the present time. We can be confident that God has many reasons, good reasons, for the things that He allows us to experience in our lives. And let me tell you that God's purpose in that regard does not depend upon our perception Of that purpose. In other words, you you cannot approach this and say, I just don't see how good is coming out of this. Well, why would you expect that you would be able to? You're not God, right? You're a finite creature and he's an infinite creator. And why, why would we expect that we could perceive that? He doesn't promise that you'll perceive the good. He just promises that it will work for the good of his people. What if you're suffering not even for your own sanctification, but for the sanctification of someone else's? You know, I I recognize that when people fall into sickness, especially people who have taken care of others for so much of their life, there is a, a desire never to be a burden on anyone else, never to be served by anyone else. You recognize that somebody has to suffer so that others can serve them, right? And you have to be unselfish at that moment. And be the instrument for God to sanctify that person, even as God works on the lingering pride within your own heart. See, we we, we cannot always be sure of how God is using these kind of experiences in our lives. We can just be sure that he is using them. And we know what he is ultimately going to use them to do. And that is to make us more like his son. Well, what is the reward of all of that? That's what we started with in Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to notice in Hebrews 12, if you go back there for just a minute, we won't reread the same verses, but we will read a few beyond it. But in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, there are multiple benefits that are enumerated with regard to God's discipline. Discipline is a mark of sonship and a proof of God's love. The Father's love in your life. He is not going to allow you to go on sinning unchecked. I've told my sons multiple times prior to disciplining them, I love you too much to allow you to grow up and be a fool. That's why you're going to get disciplined. is because I love you too much to grow up and become what you naturally want to be. I want you to grow up and become what God wants you to be. And that's what God is doing in my life as well and in each of yours. Discipline, secondly, is guided by the perfect intention and power of God. It is always appropriate. It is Always unerring. And I can't say that about my discipline of my children. I I have disciplined my children. I've gotten angry with my children to such an extent at times that I've had to go and repent and confess to them. Forgive me for being so angry. Even if they had been wrong, I was also wrong in the way that I responded to it. I'm sure that my father disciplined me many times that I didn't deserve it because I was an amazing child. And... (laughs) You recognize that God disciplines us in a faithful way. That every time he disciplines us, you can be confident. This is exactly what I need. The truth is, we need to be praying when God disciplines us and thanking God that he doesn't discipline us the way that we really deserve to be disciplined. Because he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities, the psalmist says in Psalm 103. Third, discipline is for the purpose of training us in holiness, and we can be comforted in the midst of it, knowing that that pain and struggle is making us more like Christ. Fourth, discipline, the Hebrews writer says, is only temporary. It's painful and unpleasant, but it is only a passing experience in the present. And let me tell you something. There is comfort in that. Not in some kind of a morbid way, but you recognize you're not always going to be in the mortal body that you're in right now. So there's comfort in that. Rather than raging against the dying of the light, we are longing and praying for the return of the king. Right? We are longing for the day when mortality will be swallowed up by life. I am not trying to live on this earth as long as I possibly can. I want to be faithful here and now. And I am hoping and praying that the Lord will bring me to himself. And the sooner the better. The sooner the better. Right? That's Paul's desire. Philippians 1. He says, 
I need to be here for your benefit right now, but if it's up to me, I'd rather depart and be with Christ. It's far better. The discipline that you and I experience right now may be for years. It may be for decades. That is not the blink of an eye in relation to eternity. And there is comfort in that to be found, brother. Discipline, fifth, is productive of peace and righteousness. Because it molds us for eschatological life. It teaches us, it trains us to look beyond this life. It increases our hope for heaven because when you are strong, when you are capable, when you are on top of the world, it is much harder to be interested in the world to come. And when you find yourself at the bottom of a pit with no hope of climbing out, suddenly you begin to recognize that there are things to hope for beyond this life. And that's what discipline is doing in our lives right now. Notice verses 12 through 17 of Hebrews chapter 12. The verses immediately following the section say this. Therefore lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And make straight paths for your feet. So that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it many become defiled. So that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears. And what the Hebrews writer is saying is don't let that be you and don't let that be a brother or sister in your family. That this is what we need. We need to come alongside of each other and strengthen each other and say, strengthen those drooping hands, strengthen those weak knees. Let's make sure that we're walking on a straight path. Let's pursue holiness and peace and don't be Esau. Don't take the grace of God for granted. Don't take the blessings of God for granted. So this is what discipline leads us to, and it strengthens not only each of our hearts, but it strengthens the congregation. I want to ooh, have about 30 minutes more, but I don't. So let me reflect for a moment. Yeah, I'm going to deal with this next section pretty quickly. How does God then work providentially? In terms of the wicked who are ultimately going to destruction. I, I really think this section of the confession is helpful in understanding this idea. And I want to just draw your attention to just a few things very, very quickly. There are four ways in which the confession, at least, describes God hardening the wicked. These are drawn straight out of the pages of Scripture. If you want an excellent case study of this, study the ten plagues in the early chapters of the book of Exodus. And then go to Romans chapter 9. God withholds the grace that could change their hearts. They are already wicked and he allows them to continue to be. And if you think that that is unfair, it is an indication that you think grace is owed and you don't understand the gospel yet. And I don't mean that in an unkind way. I think that there are saved people who believe in Christ who don't understand that. But I would encourage you to repent of thinking of grace that way. Grace is not owed. It's not ever owed. God is not obligated to give that grace to anyone. Not to you. Not to Pharaoh. Not to anyone. And so God is not unjust to allow the wicked to remain in their wickedness. Sometimes God withdraws the restraining and preserving graces that they already have. The simple fact is the only reason the world has not destroyed itself is because God is good and God holds it together by the word of his power and he holds evil people apart from one another. That's exactly what you see at Babel. What do you think that's going on in Genesis chapter 11 when the people are building a city and a tower that reaches into the heavens and the Lord looks down and says they have one purpose and now nothing that they propose to do will be impossible to them. Is God afraid of being unseated? Being afraid of being dethroned? No. Look at where that story falls in relation to redemptive history. God has just sent a flood to purge the world. And if that tower 
continues. If the people remain together, united in this purpose, it will only lead to a second occasion of cataclysmic judgment. And so what does God do? He scatters them so that they cannot be as wicked as they otherwise would be. You know how this works. You know that there are people that encourage others to be more wicked than they would be. You see this kind of mob mentality all the time on the news and in various events uh, around the globe that people, when they come together, are worse than they would be if they were left on their own. Well, listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, when three times God gives them up, he hands them over to their own depravity, to their own desires. He gives them more leash, knowing that they're going to wrap it around a tree and hang themselves. Third, he does this by exposing to them to the opportunity for further sins. How many times has God kept you and me from sinning by keeping us from the very occasion of sin? And the answer is we don't know because we didn't know it when he did it. And we may never know how often God saved us in that regard. He didn't owe that to us. If we had gone a different direction at any given moment, our lives would not be as they are today. In the case of the wicked, God allows those opportunities to appear before them. They do not enjoy his protection against evil and temptation. And then fourth, by handing them over to their own corruption, allowing their hearts to be hardened past the point of feeling. He did not make them evil. He did not cause them to sin. But if you will notice the way even that the confession words this, and you'll have to forgive me for not taking 30 minutes to to demonstrate all of this in Scripture. I hope that you'll see this in a lot of the material we've already covered. But if you will notice uh, in chapter 5 of the Confession and point 6, as for those wicked and ungodly men whom God, as a righteous judge, for former sins doth blind and harden, he does thusly. For former sins. You recognize that God hardens Pharaoh after Pharaoh has committed himself to a path of evil. You recognize that, right? He didn't harden them in the womb. He hardened them in the actual exercise of their sinfulness. And in so doing, demonstrates his justice. And what's interesting is that the confession goes on to describe this even happening in such a way that the wicked are, are really hardening themselves. It's not as though God is reaching into their chest wall and changing their hearts. No, he is simply providing the opportunities for them to harden themselves against his grace. The very means of grace that God uses to save one, God uses to condemn another. We recently read from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, but I'll remind you of it now. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul says, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Do you know how God hardened Pharaoh's heart? By sending plagues that offended Pharaoh's pride and threatened his control and power, that demonstrated his gods to be impotent. And Pharaoh responded to that with pride and unbelief. You know how else he hardened him? By sending his word and the requirement of his word to a proud man who was not willing to submit to it. The same preaching of Yahweh's authority that Moses brings to the children of Israel that they listen to is the same message that ultimately hardens Pharaoh's heart past the point of feeling. The classic illustration of this is of the sun which softens butter and hardens clay. But the danger of that analogy, and I do want to caution you about that illustration on one point, that could tend to encourage you to think that then the difference lies in the quality of the person's heart. And that God's word has softened my heart because at, at, at its root I have a good and honest heart. That's where that analogy falls apart. And so just be aware of that. The difference in this case is made by a loving God who changes our heart and causes us to be born again. Well, what I want to finish with then is to think about the last statement that the confession makes in chapter 5. And that is to say that God's providence blesses everything in creation. But especially the church. The wicked benefit from God's providence. I've given you a lot of scripture about this on the study guide. We don't have time to look at it right now. 
He causes the sun to rise on the good and on the evil. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Wouldn't it be so much easier, especially for elders in a local congregation, if God didn't allow it to rain on the yards of the ungodly? Of course, around here wouldn't be any help because we've all got rocks, right? But back east, this illustration worked really well. You could just drive around and you see some brown and you say, okay, we need to pay a visit. You, know, you see green grass and you say, everything's okay. God is sending rain on their house. They must be fine. That's not the way it works. God gives blessings to all indiscriminately. But He gives particular, covenantal, redemptive blessings only to His people. Only to the church. Only to the elect. And that is ultimately the focal point of all of God's providence. Providence does not mean that life will be easy. It does not mean that God will protect us from every evil in this world. Christians still get cancer. They get depressed. They're robbed, raped, kidnapped, and murdered. And evil will overtake the people of God, but it will not overcome us. And what God promises is not to keep evil from ever touching us. He promises to use even those evil acts for our eternal blessing and good. And so I want to conclude by reading these final verses from Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to the end of the chapter, as Paul reflects on the marvelous wisdom of God in His sovereign election of a people to save and His providential work in carrying out that purpose. Paul says, Romans 11, 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Or who has given a gift to Him that He might be repaid? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. Let's bow and pray. Lord, You are indeed glorious, sovereign over all that You have made, perfect in power and in every attribute that is Yours. We thank You, O God, that You have a purpose from eternity unto eternity, and that You will save the people whom You have chosen, and that not one will be lost that it is Your pleasure and purpose that will prevail and that the gates of hell shall not prevail or stand against Your church. We thank You, O oh God, that this is indeed the focal point of all of the providential dealings that You have with men. And we pray, O oh God, that we might rest secure in the knowledge and in the hope of the truths that have been set before our eyes and in our hearing this night. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.